there is there are another group of people who spend a great deal of time criticizing liberalism and that is Tommy Robinson supporters the DFLA combat 18 the supporters of Mark Collette yep. and these people are referred to as the far right and they are the enemies of Muslims politically so I wanted to ask you how do you feel knowing that politically you have a similarity with them you were both united in one thing your criticism of liberalism how does that make you feel okay that's a very interesting question actually um, the first thing is my critique was purely theological okay. it was it was not to do with the UK or politics it was just to do with the idea that man is the center of the universe from the perspective that man decides for himself what's best we don't need revelation um, and desires essentially dictate our lives. It wasn't to do with any political type of thing, but since you asked, I'll try and give a brief answer and get your thoughts and we'll go back and forth on it. So the first point is, just because there may be critics of liberalism who happen to be critics of Islam as well, it doesn't really mean that we should give up our criticism of certain aspects of liberalism. Okay? Because of course there's certain aspects which may be good. Right. The second thing is, um, when it comes to the far right itself, the far right will definitely use what it wants to attack Islam. However, that doesn't mean Muslims should ally themselves or should go full swing into the arms of liberals and give up their own principles just to fit in and be, feel protected. Because ultimately, we as Muslims, we're not people of fashion, right? We're people of tradition. Whatever our tradition is, our belief in the Quran, our belief in the prophets, our belief in uh, the early companions, the early Muslims, we try and stick to that. And if we happen to theologically disagree with the idea or ideas of liberalism and say certain people from the far right who are inclined, they sometimes use Christianity, right? If they seem to have ideas which are similar to us, I don't really see why that would be a problem. Well, it would, it would be a problem because, as you know, they are obviously enemies of Islam and Muslims. They don't like Islam or Muslims. And uh, you, both of you spend time criticizing each other, challenging each other. And quite rightly so, because the things that Tommy says about Muslims, you challenge and say they're lies and whatnot. But it's, it is worrying that they have the same political kind of uh, leanings as you do in regards to the criticism and dismantling of liberalism. For instance, heaven forbid, if they came into power politically, liberalism would disappear, liberalism would go. And what, what, what would replace it? Well, it's their, well, I, me, I'm biased. I would say they're more fascist in the way they think. They would say that they're democratic and they're patriotic. But I would say there's a lot of totalitarianism and fascism in the way they, they talk about things politically. Right. So that would take over. That would be the ideologists that would take over. Sure. So the question then is turned over to you. Because I said the same thing to a Christian. If the Christians took over in the UK politically, what would they do? And he told me. If the Muslims... Well, it depends what type of Christians they are. True, true. Uh, Not... Not the born again. <laughs> <laughs> but then I would ask you the same hypothetical question. If uh, through politics, through democracy, a uh, Islamic political party came into power, would you be get you would get rid of liberalism as well? Okay, I think there's a slight confusion here. The last time we had a discussion, I was just talking about the theological aspects of liberalism. I wasn't speaking about any political implications. I understand. But what so I'm saying I, is that and also, I generally don't talk about politics. I understand that, but it's just that even though you, you're addressing liberalism from and the theological, I, point, theological of view, point of view, yeah. they do the same as well. It's, it's both. That's what I'm saying. No, but I don't think the far right does it theologically. I think they do it politically. But when you spoke a bit, uh, when you were talking to me and you were criticizing it, you did, you did talk I, I, about... I was talking about morality. Oh, you also talked about uh, 1789, France, politically, how they had been inspired by, um, by liberalism, politically. Yeah. So, a bit of politics did come... You're right, to you're right, you're right. That, but that was more of a historical thing, but what I was trying to get at, as Muslims in this country, we're not here to challenge the status quo. We're here as Muslims, as citizens of the land, to obey the law of the land, 
and to live our lives in a way that we don't interfere with other people, they don't interfere with us, and we act in a way that we are good citizens and good ambassadors of Islam. So my conversation with you is just theological, right? Yeah. But I want to ask you a question here right now, right? So you you said previously that you believe in God. I still I still believe in a creator. You still believe in a creator. And our conversation was about the creator being a moral guide. And liberalism today doesn't say the creator is a moral guide, right? So do you think today, and I'm going to give you one moral problem, and let's look at whether liberalism can answer it or Islam can, okay? So the problem is excessive materialism, okay? I'm going to define what I mean, and I first want your thoughts whether it's a problem, then we'll look into solutions. So I'll define the problem. The problem we have today is that there is a huge excessive focus on, lib on uh, materialism, a lot of people are competing with each other in terms of wealth, in terms of image, in terms of status. A lot of people are becoming depressed because they're on social media, they see people that are richer than them, happier than them, have a higher status than them. And we have a society which is geared towards this type of um, endless rat racing. Yeah, And this is obviously a problem. And it's leading to mental health issues, it's leading to loneliness, uh, to social breakdown, to crime, to all these types of things, and ultimately unhappiness. I believe Islam has a solution, but before I get into that, do you believe materialism is a problem in today's world? Materialism exists, yes, and this is a problem. So give me an example and, and why is it a problem? Uh, to me, materialism would be um, basing your life on uh, individual needs for, yeah. your own, for your own benefit. Uh, so it could be, a, in a layman's example, buying cars, plural, when you don't need to have more than two cars. Buying excessive uh, designer clothing, stuff like that. Thinking more about um, keeping up with the Joneses, as they would say, you know, trying to materialist materialistically um, define your self-worth from your material possessions. So it does exist, and there are a lot of people who indulge in it. Yeah. There's no doubt about that, absolutely. Yeah. What do you think about the role of social media in um, in exacerbating the problem of materialism? Oh, it does. It does. That does happen as well. A lot of people in the 21st century um, they look to people who are called uh, social influencers. Yeah, that's the word. Yes. <laughs> so yes, it does exist, and there are people logging onto various social media platforms and following the lead of these influencers. So it is a problem. But are you saying then? that through the teachings of Islam, it Be would pull them away from that. Be before I get into that, I want to first extrapolate the, 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 the magnitude of the problem and before we get to the solution. Okay. So, well, to me the magnitude is there, it's all around us. It's not really, it's not seen as criminal. It's not a criminal offence. Are there people who challenge it, challenge it morally from all sectors? Yeah. But it's not a criminal offence and you have the freedom to indulge in it, this materialism, or you have the freedom to turn your back on it. Sure. And what do you think, I mean, you, you've spent most of your life, I'm guessing, in the UK, and you know that our generation is very different to the generation that was born after 9-11, say, right? The, the, the people born after the year 2000. And their level of pressure to look better, the level of pressure to uh, fit a certain narrative, it's a lot, lot greater on younger people than it was in our generation. And this has led people to actually have this excessive type of obsession with the, the way they look on social media. And this is linked to depression. And uh, there's actually uh, studies that show the link between social media used by young people and depression. Because depression is essentially when you have a blueprint, but your reality doesn't match the blueprint. And if you look at everybody's uh, world, what we see on social media is the best side of someone else's world. And most of us, when we're on social media, we see a, a world that we can never access. Yeah, I don't dispute any of that, but are you saying that liberalism is allowing that to flourish? Yeah, I'm going yeah, to get to that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I would agree with you in all of that, but like I said, it's like a, it's a matter of choice. You can either go down that path or you can't, but it's not criminalized. Okay, so about the choice thing. <coughs> If we have a situation where you have a child 
and the child has a dangerous hammer next to them, or you have a situation where the hammer safely stayed uh, uh, put away. You can argue the child, we should give it a free choice. And if it wants to, it can play with the hammer and hurt itself. Or if it wants to, it can leave it. But what's the responsible thing for an adult to do? With the child, you wouldn't give the child choice. The child has not mentally developed enough to understand the dangers of the hammer. Okay. So the child would, at that age would not be given a choice. The parent or the adult would have to teach the child, be careful of that thing, it's Good. dangerous. Good. Now with adults, are they really any different to children when it comes to choices? <laughs> Theoretically, yes. Theoretically. They're supposed to be different because they are adults, so they would understand the pros and cons. That's yeah. the theory. That's the theory. However, just like no matter how warm-blooded you are, if you're in a freezer, you're eventually by your environment if you jog around in the freezer, if you yourself up, eventually you lose because the environment around you is going to overwhelm you, right? So the same with materialism. Materialism is a dangerous thing and it's all around us. And unless it's curtailed through moral teachings, then it's going to overwhelm and subdue people. And in that regard, adults are no, no less helpless than children in regards to their environment. I wouldn't, uh, I'd need more persuading in regards to the adults. Do I believe that there are adults there who are immature, who are doing stupid things? <laughs> yes. But I would have to really study them to understand whether they are not aware of how stupid it is. Because some people, they know what they're doing, they don't care. So for instance, you have people here who might indulge in their consumption of alcohol. Now they are smart enough to know that too much alcohol will lead them to becoming drunk and antisocial. So they're not children, they know, but they still choose to go down that path. So as an adult, I can't say that they didn't know they were, they were immature, they knew, but they chose that, that was their choice. Can that choice be taken away from them? Of course, in a totalitarian society, whatever. Can they be guided away from it? They can be morally through a religion or through a, a belief system. But I, I don't think they should be viewed as children though, because they're still adults and they know what they're doing. Okay, so I'm going to make a point which may sound a bit controversial, but I'm going to try and back it up with some evidence. Most human beings, they are just as susceptible to their environment as children are, and there's an illusion of choice. Because most people, they don't make choices based upon what they like, or what they believe to be true or rational. They make it according to what society tells them is right or wrong, and what the social pressure or norm or fashion is. There are people who do that, yeah, I, I won't deny that. I, I would say the majority of people. Majority will, majority will reluctantly curtail their morals based on changes in the world. Because of the environment. And the environment as well, that does yeah. happen, absolutely. Yeah. I can't and are you aware of so uh, psychological experiments which show human beings will do the wrong thing, something they believe to be wrong, purely to fit within the social circle. There's lots of experimentation to show this. Oh yeah, I believe human beings will do that. Yeah. They will do that to fit in. Absolutely, there's yeah. no debate about it. There's that. famous experiments like Solomon Ash and others, which basically show that human beings, they will do something they believe to be wrong, simply to fit within their peers. So what I, what I want to get to is now, liberalism, and I'm only talking not politically, morally, liberalism facilitates materialism so that's the first point i'm going to make you can challenge it or we could have a discussion but i believe this to be 100 percent true liberalism facilitates materialism i would like to know how good here's how it does it if you look at the nike slogan what is it just do it just do it what is it really getting at do what you want do what you feel and today we have this concept follow your heart be free spirit, do what you desire. And the celebration of me, celebrating yourself, embracing the ego. This is something in the 21st century, it's been accepted as the norm in the, especially the Western world and other parts of the world. And liberalism is the main facilitator of this because liberalism makes the person the center of everything. So whatever the person wants to believe, whatever the person wants to do, 
and the belief in the hereafter or the belief in revelation or the belief in something beyond humans that is there to give us guidance is discarded and put under the rug. And that's why liberalism facilitates uncurtailed materialism when revelation tries to stop it. Um, I wouldn't deny that about liberalism. But you and I, we both know we're in the United Kingdom. And politically or theologically, things become confusion. Because we're in a country where they have feudalism, socialism, a bit of liberalism, a bit of capitalism, everything. So, I can't blame liberalism completely because we live in a society where we're using other things as well. So I could say feudalism probably does that, but from a, a caste system point of view, I don't know where someone of a higher caste will say that materialistically, materialistically they are entitled to a lot of stuff. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's liberalism. Does liberalism facilitate that? I would need to, I would hope that you would like have some kind of a philosopher who might have given a quote in regards to that. I'm not saying he doesn't, but I don't know enough about liberalism to say that it promotes and facilitates materialism. Okay. So let's look at the philosophy of liberalism, right? What do you think are the base assumptions of liberalism? Well, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here because it's been a while since university. Um, but I would look at the, uh, it would be um, addressing things like equality, uh, liberty, of the freedoms that people have, their equality. It would address uh, that's from a political point of view. I don't know. What, what, what about what about a moral point of view? I see that part. That's the part I don't know. Okay, so from a liberal framework, who decides what's right and wrong? I would say from a liberal framework, to me it's simple: power. Who has the power will decide. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, that's not my understanding of it, but maybe maybe you're right. But my understanding of it is it's the individual who decides what's right and wrong. No, but that. But that kind of contradicts what you told me earlier, because you said some people will fit in. Even though they don't believe in something, they will fit in with a group, because that group has the power. So do you mean by that the, pa the social power? Yes. So that group has the power, so that individual can try to do what they want, yeah. but that group, because they have the power, they've decided what should be done, they will then punish that individual. So. And it's kind of, um, how should I put it, it's very hypocritical, it's very inconsistent because the, that social group that has the power are cherry-picking the parts of liberalism that they want to adhere to. Yep. So if that individual wishes to adhere to the part of liberalism that you've mentioned where they're just thinking about themselves, the collective will say no. Yeah, I, I, I get that, but what I'm trying to get to is this. Liberalism in of itself, because you can have a whole bunch of individuals that come together and they can choose any philosophy to be the right one for fascism, liberalism, Marxism, whatever. But we're talking about the individual unit. From that perspective, liberalism basically says that individual chooses what's right and wrong for themselves. But do you live in that world though? No, no, we're talking about the theoretical framework. Okay, the theoretical side of things. Yeah. Outside of the reality of the political politics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Then, uh, theoretically, rather than me agree to that, I would like you to give me an example, because I don't know... Okay, so let, let's stick to something concrete that I think is a huge problem. In society today, it is accepted that the nuclear family is pretty much on its way out. The idea of a man, a woman coming together, raising a family is gone. What we have instead is a generation of uh, people who have affairs, you change partners regularly, broken homes, uh, people, uh, children who aren't really raised in a nuclear family environment. And now we're seeing that the respect for women has gone down significantly. And we've seen the objectification of women, which feminism was trying to challenge. It's actually gone much, much worse. And society is full of contradictions. I'll give you some contradictions which are popular. Say Kanye West, right? He is in vulgar videos where women are objectified. Yet he says about his own daughter, he doesn't want her wearing makeup. Then you get the rapper T.I. who does a virginity test on his daughter. At the same time, he's objectifying women and you know, it's a normal thing to call women in those videos hoes and this and that, right? And that is basically unchained liberalism, which comes back and hits you because you, as uh, when they were younger, they had no problem treating women like that. But as soon as their own women 
we're being treated or we're gonna be, then it's like, oh, we're not gonna accept that. And this is what happens when the moral guide is nothing but your lower desires, which is what liberalism facilitates. I will not uh, disagree with that. Those examples are good examples, which a lot of people do complain about, including me, so yeah, I would. I'll give you an Islamic solution. Okay. So in Islam, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and in the Quran, there's a big emphasis on empathy. So for example, God says things like, I'm paraphrasing here, you should forgive others because wouldn't you want God to forgive you? Or love for others what you love for yourself. There's a big emphasis on the golden rule. The big emphasis on wanting for others what you want for yourself. Okay. So when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was a young man who wanted to commit fornication. And the Prophet, he asked the Prophet, will you allow me to commit fornication? And in Islam, it's not allowed. So the Prophet didn't say to him, it's wrong, don't do it. He didn't say to him, go do it. He asked him some questions. He said, how do you like someone committing fornication with your mother? And the guy was like, he didn't like that. And he said, no, he wouldn't accept that. How do you like someone doing that to your sister? And again, he was like, he wasn't accepting that. How do you like someone to do that to your daughter? And then he got the point that this was something that he doesn't want to do to someone else. So the Prophet said to him, I'm paraphrasing here, that the people don't want for, other, for them what you don't want for your, yourself, right? So he was teaching him empathy. And in today's world, we don't have that. So this is where revelation of the Quran, the, the religion of Islam, can provide a moral guidance that in a world of materialism, liberalism only makes it worse when Islam has a solution. But then how do you, um, if that is true, how do you apply it? How do, how do, you, how do you apply it? How do yeah. you get people who are following liberalism en masse? Because we're talking a lot of people from, how do you get them to then come to the park of Islam? What you do is you popularize the narrative that I'm speaking about now, which is the Islamic solution. So in Islam, you probably heard of Dawah, right? Yes. Dawah is propagation. So what we as Muslims do is we go out and we speak to non-Muslims like yourself and we say, look, this is the problem in the world and here is a moral solution. And we don't look for one solution. We look for multiple solutions, whether it's racism, wealth inequality, sexism, um, oppression in the world, a massive, for example, a massive issue in the world is unchained capitalism. Now, if we look at many economies in the world, there is this perception that there's equality in the world. There's a perception that there is an egalitarian world order, when in reality, we're not that far off from the time of colonialism. Poor countries are bought out by rich countries, their currencies are dictated by those richer countries, and we have a situation in the world where the poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer. Did you hear recently about Jeff Bezos uh, and him making billions of dollars? That, that massive increase in wealth that he had recently? No, I didn't know about that. But I know in regards to when you were talking about um, countries controlling the currency of other countries, I know in um, the French-speaking parts of Africa, yeah. they, something they call Francophone, or where the, uh, the currency there is somehow dictated by France. The, the value of their currencies is interconnected and it's dictated by France. And, that's like, and I, that's like the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the issues of how many colonial powers till today still run things in their former colonies. And now we have another power in the world which is doing the same thing, which is China. So it's doing, you see, you've heard of the East India Company, right? Wow, we're going way back historically. Yeah. yeah. Well, how different is the Chinese Communist Party from the East India Company? They're going to poorer countries, giving them loans. They can't pay back the loans. Then they take their property. Like uh, uh, recently in uh, Sri Lanka, one of the ports, they, uh, they, get, they built it for them. They couldn't pay for it, so they decided to take you on a 99-year lease. But the, the people that allow them to do that, the leaders, would you then say they are following the philosophy of self-interest? They're being materialistic, which is liberalism. No, which is liberalism facilitates it. Okay. Yeah? So in Africa, many African countries are opening their doors wide to Chinese investment without realizing it's a Trojan horse. Without realizing they're getting battered from the Western world, now they're going to get battered from the Chinese Communist Party, right? And in a world 
without revelation, in a world without God being the moral guide, these things cannot be morally objected to. Because all, all that you have is the will to power, like Nietzsche spoke about, right? So might is right. If they have the power structures in place, they win. And with revelation, we have a trump card that we can say, no, despite of you having this power, this is morally objectionable. Yeah, I mean, I'm biased when you say that because um, I get into a lot of arguments and debates with the far right and they do use that term, might is right. So I'm biased in the sense that I would automatically agree with you. But in regards to what you said, to stem the tide of liberalism, getting more, more popular, you said one of the things that you use is Dawa. Dawa, yeah. And through, hopefully through Dawa you would convince people to come to Islam and uh, through Islam they would be following uh, the teachings, uh, the laws of Allah. Yeah. Which would, which would be against liberalism. Not only this, liberalism has a promise. And the promise is that of happiness, the pursuit of happiness, right? So if you like the American dream, um, you, have you heard of Yuval Noah Hariri? He's a, have you heard of the book Sapiens? Sapiens? Yeah, very famous book. But anyway, he's a, he's a really famous author and he's written a lot on liberalism. He's written on evolutionary biology and other stuff. Anyway, so he's a liberal, but he gives a very interesting understanding of liberalism. He says, look at every problem from an economic lens. So if someone's unhappy, it's because they don't have a job. If someone's unhappy, it's because they don't have opportunities. If someone's unhappy, it's, we have an economic solution. But the problem in the world is, not every problem is an economic problem. People have a lot of wealth, but they're miserable. And this is something which the liberal dream, it, 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 it has this uh, pipe dream, which never actually comes true. The, when you get those things, you don't become happy. So for example, Today we're told, if you're more famous, if you're more rich, if you're more acceptable, if you're more good looking, if you have a higher status, you will be happy. This is what we're told. Yet if we look at the people who have all these things, they say money doesn't make me happy. For example, Jim Carrey, he's a famous celebrity. He, uh, Ace Ventura, The Mask and all these films. So he has it all money, wealth, women, status, power, social media. And he said, I wish everybody has what I have, so they know this is not the answer. We even have rich people who commit suicide. And there's a, uh, there's a law of diminishing returns. So when you have something, you initially, you're like, wow. But over time, you get used to it and it becomes like anything else. So, so, so then, could you give me an example of one of the, um something within Islam which would challenge liberalism that, that a human being could, could use that yeah. would help them. Good, very good. Um, do you have a copy of the Quran? H hold the mic for a second please. So in the Quran, there's a big emphasis on materialism. Okay, And there's some verses in the Quran, I probably won't be able to find them by flicking through, but the verses are repeatedly about fighting off materialism to the point where God says, do not basically uh, be impressed by people of wealth, where God teaches us that the true happiness is not the happiness of having lots of wealth or status or power or image. It's actually, uh, and this is also what the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him teaches, that it's by having a relationship with God. So God links materialism and these types of things to a path which is leading away from him. And he leads content, and, and this is what the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him talks about, contentment and having a relationship with God, these are things which give you peace. So the promise of Islam, the promise of the Quran is that if you have a relationship with God, you will be happy. If you remember God, you will be at peace. Your heart will be at peace. In the Quran it says, in the remembrance of God do hearts find rest. Liberalism says, in the remembrance of society, in the remembrance of uh, celebrities, Kim Kardashian, whatever, that's where you'll get happiness. So Islam has a totally different narrative.
you see, liberalism is like Superman. It's like this unchanged power. Islam comes along with this kryptonite and says, look, it doesn't work. We have this solution. And this problem of unchained liberalism is only going to make people unhappy. Because who exists in the world today that can say, I have everything I want, I'm content. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, if the son of Adam, if a human being had a valley of gold, he would want another valley. And nothing will satisfy the human except dust in the belly, meaning when they die and, and they're in the grave and you know they're, 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 they are finished. So liberalism, it teaches us the exact opposite of what Islam is trying to teach us. So then would you have an example, because you've given me examples of um, how liberalism is affecting people. And obviously there are a lot of people who like liberalism because they live in a country that has liberalism. L L let's stick to materialism because that's... I mean, but that's part of the yeah, liberalism. Yeah. They, they like the materialism. Yeah. They haven't got a problem with it. But um, are you saying then through Islam that, not, that the person following Islam would not become in your definition, materialistic. Yes. So, but you would still have wealthy Muslims. Ah, okay, good. They, Very, they would have mansions. Yeah, yeah. Very good question. In Islam, gaining wealth is not a bad thing. So I'll tell you a little story. Once there was a young man who was walking past some of the disciples of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, some of the companions. And that uh, young man was going quite fast and he's going to work and some of the people sitting around they said if only he had the same enthusiasm for gaining knowledge of Islam instead of going for work and the Prophet said do not say that if that young man the Prophet was explaining if he's going and he's earning wealth so that he can provide for his parents then he is in the path of God he is in the path of God. If he's going to provide for his parents, if he's going to provide for his children, he's going to work to provide for his children, then he's in the path of God. If he's going to provide and work to be self-sufficient so he doesn't have to ask people, then he's in the path of God as well. And then he said, if he's going so he gains wealth and so he can, I don't remember the words exactly, but like show off or this type of thing, then he's in the path of the devil. So Islam says gaining wealth for the right intention, even that could be worship. So for example, one of the scholars of Islam, his name was Ibn Taymiyyah, a very famous scholar. He said doing business is a good thing, is actually worship because it increases your trust in God. And my father was a businessman and he used to say to me that, I'm paraphrasing here, but he used to say to me, if you don't do business, how are you going to help poor people? So if you have the intention of doing business and then giving charity and helping people and helping your relatives and doing good, you doing business as an act of worship. So Islam doesn't say be poor. Islam doesn't say don't believe in progress, don't believe in science, don't believe in, you know, become a hermit and live no, in a cave. It was, it was in regards to the materialism and you, yeah. you've already, you've explained it. Yeah. And the part from what I got that you're saying in liberalism, where the materialism is bad, is that it is about a showing off and about the self. Whereas you were saying if somebody's wealthy and they're a Muslim, you said that if they then started showing off, they, then they, they were going down the path of Satan, you said you mentioned. Yeah. So. so the thing is in Islam, showing off is a very bad thing. Okay, and the, the whole point of you having wealth is for you to get closer to God. And the thing is, Islam teaches, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, true richness is, uh, I've forgotten the narration, but basically in Islam we're taught contentment. We're not taught unbridled, unhinged materialism. Go and just earn money and try and show off. If you look at most people, most people are competing with someone else. So, oh, my neighbor has a bigger car, or this person is better looking than me, or this person got, I mean, why is it people get surgery? Why is it people go under the knife? Say, take someone like Michael Jackson. He was continuously trying to look better. And a lot of people today, someone may look at him and laugh and say, 
how ridiculous. Why did he do that? When in, re in fact, if most people had money and they could, you know, change the way they look, if they don't believe in God, if they believe in liberalism, if they believe in materialism, why wouldn't they change the way they look? Because, you know, I'm, I'm in my 30s now, I'm getting these slight lines here. You can get surgery to get rid of this. You can get liposuction. You can get all these stuff. You can make your biceps bigger, right? So this is why I believe Islam and the revelation of Islam is a cure to today's ills. Okay, yeah, um, I mean, um, as usual, I'm grateful to the talk. Learned a lot. I can say I, I can only hope you wish you the best of luck in the Dawah in helping to combat liberalism. But we don't believe in luck, but you can, oh, I understand. God's, God's blessing. God's blessing. But uh, hold this mic for a second. Let me show you something. Uh, I know you have a copy of the Quran, but I want to give you this copy. This one, this one is the uh, Farakan. Is it Farakan? Farak, Farak. Uh, uh, this, uh, this is Al, Al Furqan. Um, Do you have this one? This one. Okay. okay. It says you have this one. I want you to read I've this. I've using Tafsir to try and understand. Oh, really? Yeah. That's that's really good. There's a thing called AlTafsir.com. Yeah, that's a really good website. So, chapter 18 is called the Cave. This is something I recommend you read because this is all about materialism and this is linked to the end times. It's a very short chapter, but this chapter right from the beginning to the end, it has a huge emphasis on fighting off materialism. So make sure you have a read of that. Thank you very much, Sukur. It's a pleasure as usual.